We are going to uh, get started uh, with our webinar this morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you and your loved ones are, are doing well, given everything that's going on. My name is Steve Feldman. I'm executive director of the Greater Philadelphia Chapter of the Zionist Organization of America. And I want to welcome you. I want to uh, thank my colleagues who are working behind the scenes to uh, make this a smooth event. Natalie and Alan, thank you. And also, I want to greet my colleagues from uh, the Florida chapter, Sharona, and the Pittsburgh chapter, Stu. Welcome. Uh, and any of my colleagues who are here today, welcome to the event. Uh, I want to introduce, um, well, actually, before I introduce our, our panelists, I want to welcome our local and national ZOA leadership. Thank you for uh, your active role in our organization. Uh, and without further ado, I want to uh, welcome our chapter president, Kevin Ross, to uh, also welcome you to today's event. Steve, Kevin? thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being on the program today. Um, ZOA uh, will, will not disappoint today. We've got some great speakers. And uh, there is a very large body of uh, anti-Israel bias to present, unfortunately. And we've got some of the best people to talk about it because they are some of the best soldiers on the front lines of combating anti-Israel media bias. So it's going to be a great program today. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, this uh, event is sponsored by Bruce Holberg in honor of Greater Philadelphia ZOA. Bruce, thank you for sponsoring today. Pleasure. And uh, I want to remind everybody that ZOA is a nonpartisan organization. We're a nonprofit, and we ask that if you take advantage of the chat room, that you please keep the chat comments civil and on the topic that we're discussing today. And if time permits, we will uh, take questions. I want to introduce our panelists today. Bruce Holberg is an active uh, member of ZOA. He spent a 35-year career in radio broadcasting, beginning as a news director and program director, managing a variety of radio stations in Philadelphia, Baltimore, Chicago, and elsewhere, and eventually uh, be became an owner of radio stations, an owner and operator. Uh, he is now retired, but continues to monitor the media uh, for anti-Israel bias. And our other panelist, Jerome R. Berlin, is a retired executive with a custom software development firm. He's a past national president of the Jewish fraternal organization, Brith Shalom. And for 19 years, every week, he has published something called the Brith Shalom Media Watch, which as the name implies, keeps an eye on the media uh, and specifically for anti-Israel bias. He's co-founder of the nonprofit website, factsonisrael.com, author of the book, Israel 3000 Years on Continuous Jewish Presence in the Land of Israel and co-author with Lee Bender of Blessed Memory of the book, Pressing Israel, which discusses anti-Israel media bias. He is a uh, past vice president of our chapter and remains chairman of our media committee. So welcome to you both. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Uh, in many ways, the media is the biggest threat today to support for Israel. It is Im immensely influential, uh, and there's more media than ever before today, and so more opportunities to, to deceive the public. So few outlets are balanced, while millions are deceived each day. Uh, so few outlets uh, have the right terminology, a fair perspective, or even in terms of what they cover versus what they ignore. There's media bias that's pervasive. Uh, and it's so bad, it's, it's, it's subtle and almost subliminal to most media consumers. So we uh, hopefully in the next hour are going to shed some light on media bias. And we're gonna begin with Bruce, who really is expertise in, in broadcast media, which is of course, television and radio. Bruce, take it away. Sure. Uh, well, the, the first question that comes up is what are we talking about in terms of media? Um, the fact of the matter is, is that that landscape has changed immensely uh, over the past, uh, the past uh, 10 years, maybe even five years. Every year, more and more people decide to get their news primarily from uh, social media. 
Um, in uh, 2018, there was a story uh, that uh, from a study uh, by the Pew Foundation that said that 49% of US adults who get their news often get it from television. Um, that was followed by 33% from a news website, 26% from radio, and 20 from social media, and only 16% from print newspapers. So uh, obviously, if you look at, at the lines plotting, you, you see the traditional media going down, you see the social media coming up. There was just today, as a matter of fact, released a, um, a study that shows where uh, seven-year-old to 54-year-old Americans get their news often. And shocking as it may be, um, whether you're a Gen Zer, a millennial, or a Gen Xer, uh, the biggest source is Facebook. The second biggest source is YouTube, and the third biggest source is Instagram. Now, this is important because these are basically unregulated. They're, they're not managed in any detail. There's no, there's no qualification that items be true when they're put on. Um, there, I saw another, in my research, I saw another uh, chart that showed that by far most people don't believe what they see or hear on these sites, but yet they keep going back to them for news. It isn't until we get to the number four slot that we have what would be a convention, what we would usually call a conventional news source, and that, regrettably, is CNN. Uh, that's followed by Twitter, ABC TV, Fox News, the New York Times, NBC, CBS, your local newspaper, your, your local radio station. So. What, what's going on is, um, uh, in terms of ZOA and similar organizations, is sort of a whack-a-mole game. I mean, it's very, very difficult to try to uh, monitor all of these sources. Hello? Uh, can, Steve, can you see me? Or uh, I see you, but somebody is uh, trying to put things on the, uh, on the share screen. Ah, there we go. So, um, uh, that, so it, it, it's sort of like a whack-a-mole thing, you know, you, you, you spot one, you, you try to knock it down, and no sooner do you do that than something comes up over here. And um, it's helpful, I think, to know how, uh, how a news broadcast is put together, and I assume that the same thing is true with the social media uh, the social media uh, uh, information. Uh, both the, the individual stories and the newscast as a whole are different between broadcast and, uh, uh, and print media. If you think of a triangle with, with broadcasting and other media, the wide end is at the top. The first sentence is everything that you absolutely need to know about the story. A car hit a parked car on 8th Street. Whereas in, in newspaper, it starts with the narrow end. And it says, Bob was on his way home this afternoon when he had an unfortunate occurrence. And then it'll expand and expand and expand and expand. And the way those grow have to do with a number of things. It, ha it has to do with the target audience uh, that's being addressed by the, uh, uh, by the information. It has to do with um, other stories that may have been covered as uh, 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 prior to that, whether it's a follow-up or not. Uh, generally, um, uh, there is a... Uh, uh, problem that we have in that among the sources that we monitor or have to take into account, it's, there are two things going on. One, it's fairly easy to bury something, even if it is accurate, toward the bottom end of the triangle. 
The other thing about it is that there are forces at work that we're not always aware of. There are, I think we can agree, there are, there are media agendas. And those can be affected by a number of things. It, there can be an overall agenda. Um, for instance, the NBC stations. NBC is owned by the Roberts. The Roberts are left-leaning Philadelphians. And another part of that is they can't like break one off and say, well, we're going to be conservative on this one and we're going to be uh, liberal on this one. We're going to be something else on this one because people pick up on that and take them to task. One of the things that, uh, that I faced here in Philadelphia when I was running radio stations is that I had an AM that was country and an FM that was black program. And it didn't take long before the, um, uh, those who were on our case from uh, the black community started monitoring the newscasts of the AM station. And so we were somewhat constrained in what we could do uh, on, on the AM station for fear of violating our trust with the audience we had established uh, on the black program station. That happens in other connections. Uh, yesterday, uh, there was a, a, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but there was a situation where a newly formed Fox network, Fox Soul, was going to have a broadcast by Louis Farrakhan on July 4th. Now, without getting into the wherefores, whys, and ramifications uh, in the broader sense, don't you think that that colors our feeling about Fox and their other, their other programming? And so uh, management has to be uh, well aware of that. And um, uh, the, the other thing I was going to bring up is even in local media, it's difficult to, uh, it's difficult to keep people on the straight and narrow because look how much network supplied news they get. If I were to go to, uh, uh, to the local NPR station and say, I think that you miscast Israel, da, 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 I get a, don't talk to me. We just take whatever comes down the pipe from NPR. And the same thing is, is true, unfortunately, from, uh, from the Associated Press and uh, uh, Reuters and other news networks. So, I mean, there are a lot of riptides at work here. It's not as simple sometimes as we think it is. It's against the backdrop where uh, organizations, news organizations, like most organizations, have to do more with fewer people. And even if they don't have an agenda, things can slip through the cracks. Bruce, explain to us uh, from the perspective of a news director how it is determined what gets on the, the news segment, if it's a radio, you know, a, a music station, or if it's all news, uh, what gets in, what doesn't get in, what is the process? Well, it's a little different from an all news and from a, uh, a music station. But if we're talking local, it's generally a local story that's the default position for the story that's going to be the lead in the newscast. Unless something is really extremely important um, happening now, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I hate to say it, but after you get the, um, after you get that first story, then you usually come back with a couple of lesser stories and some audio, usually an audio report from somebody either in the field or from the network, something like that, and then a wrap up. So, uh, the place, to watch generally is those two stories if it's uh, a music station and uh, if it's a news station uh, I'm sure you realize if you've listened to them they have sort of a clock where they hit certain kinds of stories at right. certain times in the hour. Now as far as what's used and what's not used um, I do believe that uh, there's an overriding concern about the target demographics of the broadcast outlet. And uh, it, it, if, if there's something that skews, 
out of that, it tends to go to the bottom of the, the stack. And do you normally, does a news director, where do you get your news from? Is there an electronic service that you use or AP or does somebody read things right out of the New York Times generally? Boy, that's such an interesting question, Steve. Just as the, uh, just as the number of news outlets uh, has uh, exploded, so have the number of news sources. There are, there are blogs, which news people, if they're really serious about it, ought to avoid. There are information services. Um, in many markets, the same organization that supplies the traffic reports to the uh, radio and TV stations also have, quote, news sources, unquote. And, and largely, uh, if it isn't off of a wire service, uh, the, uh, the, the writers for that are generally unvetted, unskilled, uh, sometimes people who have been out of radio and uh, can't get back in, but more often than not, somebody on the way up. And so the news comes at you from, from the internet, from all over the place, and then from these news contract uh, operations. Uh, where you turn over a certain amount of commercial inventory to an organization and they give you traffic and news and things like that. And what can people do, you know, again, putting on your, your either your station owner or your station management hat, if people hear uh, or see, uh, if it's TV, uh, anti-Israel bias, what do you recommend people do? What gets your attention as somebody who's in management or ownership? Well, the very first thing is be accurate. Uh, avoid broad sweeping statements, uh, be prepared to give specifics and quote them accurately. Um, it is, it's really important to get to the management. Uh, in a TV station, you probably won't, you'll probably get to the news director. Uh, the management, the uh, general manager has somewhat of a different viewpoint than somebody involved in pumping out the news uh, every day. Um, it's better if you can walk in with an organization behind you, much better, and people take you more seriously. It's the best if you at some point have been able to make contact with somebody in the organization who can be your sort of internal champion and go to the general manager and say, this guy is not, uh, uh, loose cannon, you ought to listen to them. Um, there is no easy way in many organizations. Yes, I mentioned what happened yesterday with, uh, with Fox. Uh, they had, uh, they had uh, an email address and three phone numbers on various publications that I found online. Went to the first, uh, went to the first phone, it was a recording. Went to the second phone, it was recording. Went to the third phone and ha ha, somebody picked up. And I said, I would like to speak to somebody in management and they hung up on me. Huh. So, so much for that. And then I, I ended up sending an email and I got a basic email that you always get back. that says, thank you for your input, it's very valuable. We're besieged with these things. Uh, frankly, we couldn't care less and we won't be getting back to you. So, uh, Bruce, yeah. is there, uh, sorry to interrupt, is there, as, as a manager, as a station manager, as a news director, is there a word or a phrase that, that a listener or a viewer conveys to you that really gets your attention that says, wow, there really must be a problem that I'm not aware of at the station? Whether you believe it or not, it's better not to lead with an accusation of an overt act. It's better to say, you might be aware of this or you might not, but I have an observation I'd like to share with you and engage them that way. Because if you do it another way, it's, I was listening to you the past three days and, you, and, and you're just continually going off the track. They won't listen to you. They won't pay any attention to you at all. Um, and I, I don't want to stress it, uh, uh, too strongly, but I don't want to understate it either. Advertisers' dollars do speak. And 
when I see things like Tucker Carlson losing sponsors like AT&T and the Walt Disney Company and, and several others, I think that they take a look at the ledger at the end of the year and say, yeah, this could say this guy's good. He gets us big audiences, but what the heck, we can't monetize it. So they may go in a different direction. Those discussions, trust me, do take place. Thank you, Bruce. Now I want to go over to uh, examine print media with Jerry Verlin and Jerry every week for 19 years. That's uh, it's quite a, a record that you've been studying the media. You've written books about the media. You continue to analyze the media. Uh, tell us about uh, print media and the biases there. And, and maybe uh, if you can also contrast a little bit from uh, what Bruce, Bruce was saying. Well, um, what you asked me to do, Steve, was to pick out five issues that I think are really critical in anti-Israel media bias in the print media, and <clears throat> to some extent it also applies to the uh, broadcast media because the same basic thinking applies to media in general. The most severe damage that is done to the Jewish people in Israel by the media, in my opinion, is not only with respect to particular facts and particular stories being distorted, but the basic perspective of which they apply to the state of Israel as the Jewish people's homeland. And there are three periods that I think that they distort. One is what happened in 1948, what happened in 1967, and what's going on right now. The first distortion of history is that the media loves to say Israel was created and founded in 1948. And it shuts off the presence of the Jewish people in the land of Israel for 3,000 years. They like to say that what happened in 1948 was the creation of Israel, influx of a bunch of Jews, and they displaced, quote, the Palestinians who were the native people, at least in modern times. And the difficulty with that, from our point of view, is that that's not what happened at all. The population of Palestine in 1948 was about a million Arabs and 600,000 Jews. So it was not a reversal of population, what happened. And the Jews did not come in cold in 1948. They didn't even come in cold with the Zionist movement in the late 19th century. The state of Israel is the next native state in the land of Israel since the Roman destruction of the uh, Hasmonean kingdom, Judea. And the Jews were there. Historian Parks loved to say that the continuous post-biblical presence of the Yeshuv wrote the Zionist real title deeds. And I was so taken with that that I, I wrote a book about it, Israel 3,000 Years. And... It is true that we were the minority for most of that time, but we never left. And the idea that we came in cold and threw out the Palestinians in 1948 is just a distortion of history, no matter how many times the media says it. Another thing about 1948, the media keeps saying is, quote, the Palestinian refugee issue. What this does is suppress that as a result of the Arab-Israeli conflict over Palestine, more Jews were dispersed from vast Arab and other Muslim lands whom Israel absorbed than Arabs left tiny Israel. So when they say Palestinian refugee issue, they're ignoring the existence in Israel of hundreds of thousands who've had descendants. And together with the old Yeshuv's descendants, Israel is not a European implant in the Middle East. The is Jewish people is indigenous to the Middle East, and the state of Israel's majority population is people who are descended from those indigenous Jews. If you go to 1967, there are media 
expressions that likewise distort severely what happened uh, against the interest of us. For example, they say that the ceasefire lines of 1949 were Israel's 1967 borders. And there is a vast distinction in international perception between borders and ceasefire lines. Borders have a gravitas and ceasefire lines don't, particularly ceasefire lines that were replaced by later ceasefire lines between the same sides. What the 1949 Israel-Jordan Armistice Agreement very clearly said, literally, was that this line, this green line, drawn with a green pen, represented where their armies then stood and was not to be taken in any sense other than military and particularly not as international final borders. So when the media says that Israel crossed over the 1967 borders, that is a misstatement of fact. And when the Reform and conservative movement wrote that letter last year to President Trump, this open letter, and they used the expression 1967 borders, uh, and they want the new waters to, to apply with adjustments to those 1967 borders. That is not an accurate statement of history. A second thing that relates to 1967 beyond the borders is the characterization of Judea, Samaria, and historic Jerusalem. Media loves to use the terms occupied territories, Palestinian territories, occupied Palestinian territories, and they use the word West Bank insistently. And they say that the names Judea and Samaria are, quote, the biblical names for the West Bank. And that is a total misrepresentation of history. The names Judea and Samaria remained in use all through the centuries between ancient times and today. It wasn't until 1950 that Jordan, after the invasion, renamed them as West Bank. And one very telling example of the continued existence of Judea and Samaria as the names of these places is that the United Nations, in drawing the partition resolution in 1947, didn't say West Bank because it didn't exist then, it used the expression Judea and Samaria. And the net effect of all of this is to make it seem that the Jews have no historical claim to the quote West Bank. And then they say East Jerusalem. Jerusalem, thousands of years old city, never had two separate places, West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem until 1948 when the invading Jordanians, unfortunately for us, were able to maintain their grip on the old city and surrounding areas. And it wasn't until 1967 that we threw them out. The Jews have had a majority in Jerusalem since 1800s Ottoman time. And Jerusalem in the last 3000 years has been the capital of three states the kingdom of Judah, the Asmonean kingdom, Judea, and Israel today, it has not been the capital of anything else. And to say that the Jews build settlements in Jerusalem is, is a total outrage. And the public should understand that the Jewish claim to Jerusalem is the strongest claim in the last 3,000 years. And the fifth point that I would make, Steve, is that today, a very crucial misrepresentation, and the Jews are doing this too, is to say that what Israel is threatening to do, quote unquote, is to annex territory in the quote West Bank. And the correct definition of what Israel is doing, if they do it, and I hope they do, is apply sovereignty. Annex if you look it up in a dictionary, and you can do that on in Word, is to say, to take over territory of another entity and claim it as your own. Whereas apply sovereignty connotes extending your law to a place that you have legitimate right to be. Exactly. As for the 
things that people should do beyond just observing and recognizing all these distortions in the media and other places is most of the media is also on the internet as a website of the organization that does the print media. And these articles show up there. And what we used to do in the olden days is we would write letters to the editor. And the difficulty with that was that it was days and days before they became present in front of the public and they were censored and they were cut and they were often not representing what you really said. But on these internet articles, you can put a comment down in that article and it's there immediately and it is as widely distributed as the article itself and as grassroots people i would urge everyone not only to be aware of what the media is doing and even the jewish media and some people that are our greatest advocates are using terms like west bank and annexation and it doesn't make sense so when you see this in an article, even by our people, put it on a comment, and as soon as you put the comment in, the higher it is to the top, and it is far more effective for both time and distribution reasons than the old letters for the editor. Thank you, Jerry. Now I'm gonna do a uh, screen share and, and talk about and give some examples uh, about media bias. Just a little bit of background on me. Uh, I was a print reporter for about 23 years and have done, uh, I guess, around six, seven years of radio over the years. So um, uh, I've been, uh, I've seen things both from the perspective of somebody in the business and uh, for the last 18 years at COA, somebody who's been a, a critic and monitor of the media. So I'm gonna show some examples. Uh, let me get my PowerPoint. We at ZOA just had a uh, letter published in the Philadelphia Inquirer we do contact the media very frequently. Uh, there's a uh, notorious columnist named Trudy Rubin, who's actually nationally syndicated. Uh, she uh, uh, really uh, picks on Israel relentlessly over the years, and uh, she's very well known locally. And uh, when she is pr particularly egregious, we send uh, the paper uh, a letter to the editor, and if we're lucky, they print it. Now, I think most of you will recognize this. This is one of the most notorious and egregious uh, incidents of media bias uh, in recent years. This is the New York Times International Edition, and this cartoon raised uh, quite an uproar and obviously speaks for itself. Uh, this uh, seems rather harmless. It's a uh, feature that Reuters sent around that was published on Yahoo. Uh, about Palestinian fashion. What could be bad about that, right? Well, the thing that really stands out about these kind of features is, you know, people see news articles, so-called news articles, they expect bias or they understand things, but people who read about fashion or culture might not uh, really see the media bias for what it is. Uh, and uh, these are some of the most dangerous articles in terms of turning people against Israel. So it talks, the headline talks about, you know, Palestinian refugee camp, uh, you know, why are there Palestinian refugees in Jordan in 2020, we might ask. Now, when you get into the meat of the article, uh, this woman uh, designs these uh, Arab uh, garments called thobes, uh, and she says it's uh, Palestinian, specifically to Palestinian. We'll see about that in a second. But here's what's really interesting. She's 47 years old, uh, supposedly born in this refugee camp, but at 47, she recalls what her parents did 53 years ago. That's something. She's got a uh, pre-birth memory, apparently, uh, of things that happened before she was born. Quite interesting. And here's that phobe again. She claims it's specifically Palestinian. Wait, let's get back. Uh, it's commonly worn in the Arabian Peninsula, Iraq, neighboring Arab countries, Iran, East and West Africa. So it's not specifically a Palestinian Arab garment, uh, yet she tries to pass it off as that, or the, or the reporter does anyway. Uh, same article, many of Jordan's populations are descendants of Palestinian refugees, uh, which of course uh, the media, as Jerry I think alluded to, claim are uh, in the millions, and, and there really were only a couple hundred thousand at the time, and not all of them 
were even uh, refugees, and she wants to revive Palestinian folklore, whatever that is. And she says, uh, quote, our attire is unique. And despite the small size of Palestine, there is great variety in the dresses. But the reporter never interjects that there is no country called Palestine today. It's passed off as fact. Uh, and again, things about refugee camps to someone who is reading a cultural piece or a, a, uh, a feature article, uh, this is all new to them. And they get, they get uh, turned against Israel. They believe the lies. This is an article, another article. This one happens to be five years old, but there's some really uh, important examples here. Um, Jerry, I think you would agree with me that the, uh, the photo that goes with an article when there is a photo is, is really one of the more deceptive and persuasive uh, methods of anti-Israel bias. The story, Worth 10,000 words. That's right. The story is about Israelis being attacked. And uh, this particular week when this article was written, 11 Israelis were attacked, and yet the photo is of Israeli soldiers. They look like they're uh, patting down this uh, Palestinian Arab suspect, uh, and maybe someone is going to look at that and think that uh, the IDF is abusing, uh, you know, a Palestinian Arab who uh, clearly seems to be unarmed. So the photo, people see the photo and might not even read the article, and it's completely misleading. Uh, the headline, the photos are, are of prime importance, and second to, to that are the headlines. You know, sometimes people don't even bother to read the article, but they see the photo, they'll read the caption, they'll look at the headline, they'll move on. And in this particular case, they've been indoctrinated against Israel. And very often, a photo has nothing to do with the story. Exactly. This is another uh, important example when. Uh, a Jew is accused of doing something the media characterizes as a definite thing, not even a question. When an Arab, a Palestinian Arab, generally commits uh, a crime or some act of terrorism or violence, it's always uh, couched as not definite. So here, uh, this woman holds a picture of her son, Fadel Kwasami, who was killed. Definitely, he was killed by a Jewish settler, it says. But the settler accused the youth of trying to stab him as if it didn't really happen. It's just an accusation. The, the article, this particular article is replete from comments from the Palestinian Arabs uh, about their victims and alleged victims. There's no comment in the article about uh, or from Israeli victims. Guy blew himself up with a suicide belt was called a suspected militant. Right. So here's a, uh, a headline, five Palestinians shot dead by Israeli forces. We don't really know why. Uh, the lead claims that they were just protesters and all they had were slingshots. So, I mean, imagine the impact on somebody who doesn't know. They, you know, five Palestinians randomly shot dead by Israel, says the headline you read on. Well, they were just protesting and all they had were slingshots. And, you know, again, the reader might deduce, gee, those terrible Israelis. Look at the uh, author's name. Well, you can't control who the writers are. You know, I've, uh, I've seen plenty of correspondence with uh, Jewish sounding names who are just as bad. Uh, this is one of my pet peeves that is pretty much universal throughout the media. Pro-Palestinian activists. Are they really pro-Palestinian or anti-Israel? If you can see, one of them is holding a sign, support Palestinian human rights, boycott Israel. They never say support Palestinian human rights, demand that the PA has an election, you know, or demand that the PA stops <clears throat> stealing aid money. So none of these people are really genuinely pro-Palestinian. They're all anti-Israel, and yet the media keeps repeating pro-Palestinian activists. The media used to compare the pro-Iranian Hezbollah with the Israeli-backed Lebanon militia. <laughs> okay, so this, uh, this was a, the same article. There was a protest because the Philadelphia Orchestra was going to be playing in Israel shortly after this, and there were all these protests. Uh, and here, this again is an example of something. This was printed in the, uh, in the uh, feature section of the Inquirer by their classical music columnist, uh, so again, people who might never care about these issues or read about these issues suddenly are reading it. 
They see a blanket accusation of Israel committing apartheid, and there's nothing in this article to rebuff that. It's not challenged. It's not rebuffed. It, it's just the propaganda from the anti-Israel people repeated whole cloth. Same article, uh, the writer talks about entertainers who are boycotting Israel, never mentions all the entertainers who perform in Israel, some of them a lot more prominent than Elvis, Costello, and Lord, but the readers are not told about that, just the bias. Another example, this is from NPR on their website. So NPR, of course, does radio, but they also list articles on their website. Palestinians uh, are uh, never mentioned when, or not never, but rarely mentioned when they're the attackers. When they're the victims, though, the media is certainly sure to mention that they are the victims. Uh, it's unclear why Israeli special forces entered the Gaza Strip. Really? Well, they've been firing rockets for a week up until the IDF decided to put a stop to it. But the media tells its audience, who knows why Israel went in? Uh, they describe Hamas's military wing as if it uh, is really some sort of a separate branch as compared to uh, their humanitarian wing. And again, when Palestinian Arabs are victims, they're identified as Palestinians. Uh, but when they're aggressors, it's just random militants. Steve, there was a headline in the Enquirer that said uh, Israeli army killed four Palestinians. And the text of the article by the AP says that Hamas claimed them as its agents on a jihad mission. <laughs> uh, again, uh, this is NBC News. Uh, they talk about resistance, uh, but no... Uh, inkling of what they're resisting at this point. And again, the term West Bank, as Jerry mentioned, is, is a very loaded and politicized term. Uh, the, the writer talks about uh, increased settlement building, but there haven't been any new uh, Jewish communities for years and years and years. Uh, they, of course, record, refer to occupied territory, as, as Jerry touched on. It's not occupied. It, at worst, it's disputed. And they really play up what happened. This uh, Palestinian Arab teenager on video punched out this Israeli soldier, and they're making a big deal that she was arrested. But uh, I imagine if any American teen went up and punched a police officer, although maybe not over the last three months, but before the last three months, uh, they might get arrested. Uh, just some more examples here. Uh, we see this often. Uh, the Palestinian Arabs complaining that it, to end decades of statelessness, well, there never was a Palestinian state. So again, it's more propaganda. And that's pretty much that story. This is another uh, narrative we see over and over again. Whenever Jewish communities are referred to, they're always referred to as settlements. <clears throat> the Arab communities are referred to as towns and villages. Again, there's uh, an inherent bias in that. Uh, just things to look for, especially with regard to print media or even online, uh, the placement, whether it's something's on the front page or they, as they say, above the fold, take a look at the headline. Is there a photo and who or what is the photo of the terminology that we've been talking about, the tone of the article or of the broadcast, the balance, who's interviewed. Uh, there used to be a show on ABC, I think it's still on actually, called Nightline. Uh, and they would have they would have balance. They would have an Arab and an Israeli, and often the Israeli they would have on would be more anti-Israel than the Arab. But it was balanced because they had an Arab and an Israeli. So you have to pay attention to that. Uh, and then what is the purpose of the report? What is the motive? What are they trying to show or tell their audience? It's important to contact. Good communication can counter, offset, and mitigate bad communication. So please be in touch with the media. Here in Philadelphia, we've created a uh, media action guide. We have contact info information for TV, radio, print. I suggest wherever you are, you think about doing that, putting together a local listing of your media outlets and the contacts. We update this every year. Uh, this is both uh, to react to something that's anti-Israel or to be proactive. And proactive is very important. We also have tips on our website 
uh, about contact in, in the media, what to say, <clears throat> how to phrase things. Uh, if you're writing letters, just some tidbits about that. A caller and email the media, always be polite. Uh, if you're talking about a newspaper, you want to try and get to the news editor, TV or radio, news director. If you're on the web, usually down on the bottom, they have an about us or uh, ways to get in touch with uh, the website or the blog. And it's really not generally worth it to try and contact the reporter. Be proactive. Don't wait for something bad to respond to. Israel is doing, doing wonderful things in the world, science, technology, medicine. These two websites, nocamels.com, israel21c.org, list all kinds of wonderful positive developments that you should take advantage of and submit them as letters to the editor or contact the media. Ask them why they don't uh, place any pro-Israel stories, any positive stories. Uh, we're doing a lot of webcasting during the pandemic. If you want to support uh, or sponsor a local Philadelphia ZOA telecast webcast, please contact our office at 610-660-9466. You can contact National ZOA to do likewise at info at zoa.org. And there's our email contacts and the contacts are also in the chat. I want to take some questions. How are we doing for time? We're good. So Mike Perloff submitted a question online. Mike, are you, uh, are you with us today? Unmute yourself. Mike? Done. Uh, you asked two questions. I, I really want to uh, answer your question about, is it your opinion? Actually, ask your, your, your question about the journalists being victims or participants, please. I don't have the question in front of me, but right, so I'll read so it. Go ahead and read it. I'll Please. read it. Sure. Is it your opinion uh, that most journalists are innocent victims of the lies and phony propaganda of Israel's adversaries, or instead that they are purposely portraying the Jewish state in a negative light? Good question. Um, I think that it's a combination of purposeful ignorance of facts and history. Uh, fear of reprisals if they're stationed in the Middle East or if their colleagues are stationed in the Middle East. Uh, we've heard about attacks against journalists. Uh, there was the familiar incident. Uh, there was uh, two IDF soldiers were lynched. They, they lost their way. They wound up, I think, in Ramallah. And we all saw the scene of the bloody hands uh, of the window and those soldiers were later lynched. And it was an Italian media outlet that broadcast that and their uh, staff uh, in the area were threatened and they ended up apologizing and promising never to do that. Uh, I don't believe that the, that the media is innocent uh, of their bias. Uh, Bruce, Jerry, anything to add on that? I would just say that, <clears throat> excuse me, that Mike has done something rather remarkable. He put together a 10 editions, I think, of a list of, of terms that are dirty words with explanations. I think if we could take his list and the list that we have on, on factsonisrael.com and ZOA stuff, put it together, we could have a, a, a lexicon that is in contrast to the loaded lexicon that's used against us. Mm -hmm. That's good. Well, I think you, there's you one other thing about that. Go there's on. another thing when you talk about the individual uh, writers. <clears throat> they at the at the point where they're hired i don't think it's ever verbalized but i think that management gets a sense of where they're coming from and quote whether they'll fit unquote or not and it's sort of self-perpetuating there there's a lot of factors there really is a lot of factors uh, if anybody has any other questions please put them in the chat we're taking questions now um there's a good question are there some karen vestner uh you want to unmute yourself and ask your question Karen? Um, hi, Steve. Thank you for this. Uh, I'm uh, so involved in uh, volunteer work for camera, uh, truth and accuracy in reporting. And I'm having a very, very hard time. I'm published in many, many international. Okay, uh, just please ask your question, okay? Well, I'm, I'm having trouble uh, getting my pieces. Uh, do you hear me? We hear you, but somebody is attempting to uh, do a screen share. 
Okay, well, anyway, I'm trying to find out if you can suggest any places that I can get my articles published because I'm having a harder time uh, get, getting them printed. Publishing is tough. Uh, I do a lot of writing for American Thinker. Uh, they publish a lot of pro-Israel uh, columns. Uh, you might try that, or you can start a blog at Times of Israel. They're, they're pretty much open-ended. I'm in both, but I wanted others. No, those are the two I would suggest. Thank you. Steve, or, uh, I'm you, looking for some other, go ahead, Bruce. I, I'm wondering if there are other, quote, good outlets, unquote, that you could recommend for us. Absolutely. Uh, so some of the better outlets, I think, are blogs. I, don't, I would not say there is a good, uh, certainly American uh, news outlet that is uh, really unbiased. They all have bias, even uh, what many people view as, as a favorite Fox News, their correspondent in Israel happens to be terrible. Uh, I like to go to Elder of Zion, which is a good blog that really wraps a lot of stuff up, has a lot of good links. Israel Hayom, I like. Uh, the Jewish News Service, uh, Al Jaminer. They're okay. places that I, that I go to daily uh, and sometimes more than once a day that uh, have, uh, I would say, unbiased reports and, and op-eds. Uh, I read most of the Israeli websites that are in English. Um, some are better than others. Uh, I look at American media just to see what they're reporting, but I don't uh, trust any of it, frankly, to really bring the truth uh, about what's happening with regard to the Middle East. Uh, I do look at a lot, and, and sometimes in the middle, uh, you find the truth if you compare different news sources, but it's really hard. The anti-Israel media bias is uh, very pervasive. Somebody asked, they want to remain anonymous, which is fine. Are there any attempts made to educate and deal with wire sources and other sources of media rather than tending to this on our individual communities? Uh, I would say uh, you need to do both. You need to stay focused on your local media outlets. Uh, AP, I know, has offices throughout the country. We've contacted local AP. Um, and a lot of the local papers that are, that are members of, of AP have a stronger voice in responding to AP than do uh, just readers or, or listeners. Uh, Jerry or Bruce, any, any suggestions about uh, contacting the wire services and trying to educate them? I tried. It's uh, not very likely. The, when, the Zio, when the AP kept saying over and over, millions of Palestinian refugees and their descendants you know, I wrote them a letter and I quoted them exactly. And I didn't get anywhere. Hmm. Yeah, somebody mentioned in the chat, the Washington Free Beacon. You're absolutely right. It's, it's very good news uh, about Israel. Uh, you know, it's balanced. When I say good, I mean balanced and, and some other subjects. So, yes. I'm just curious, as far as ZOA is concerned, does our Washington staff make any attempt to... Uh, gain on trade to AP and other news services that are headquartered there. Uh, I don't know about about that. Uh, AP and AP's. I think their headquarters are in uh, New York, if I'm not mistaken. But AP, you know, is a is a um, is a co-op essentially. They get they get articles from their correspondents around the country, and different reporters around the country feed them stories. They send them out on the networks. So, um, what can I tell you? Uh, it's it's hard. It's it's definitely hard to find unbiased news. You have to be an informed news consumer, I would say, and and see what you're reading, um, and and try and discern the facts from there. Uh, all of us can can really help out by talking to our friends, talking to our families, who maybe may not be up on anti-Israel media bias, and we can, you know, show them an article, explain the problems in the article. We can do that ourselves one on one with people. It's, uh, it's a responsibility for, uh, for each and every one of us. Bruce or Jerry, any uh, closing thoughts? Uh, I think I appreciate very much you're including me in this. I think it's extremely important that we get our own people who write articles like and columnists to use the right language. If we don't, who will? I think that the... Um, I think that there, there's a, 
sort of an iceberg here. The mass media is bad, are, are bad enough, and, they, and we can see what they're doing. What we can't see going on, unless we're really astute, is all of the, um, uh, all of the social media and what they're putting out there. Somebody asked a question, uh, just FYI, there, uh, in 2016, the primary news source was television with 15%. And then in 2018, just two years later, it was down to 49%. And that's the direction things are going. And these are the least visible uh, purveyors of, of news that we see. Hmm. Well, of course, uh, you know, Facebook, social media, things like that, they're, they're kind of self, uh, self-edited by people who post uh, with, with, as you said, no controls of those. Lately, we have been uh, seeing and hearing about censorship, but it, they're certainly not as responsible as uh, a uh, traditional media outlet is supposed to be. I want to remind everybody to please support ZOA and the work that we do, both uh, locally in the greater Philadelphia region and nationally. If there's a ZOA chapter in your area, please support that. Our contact information is in the chat. I'll just repeat it once again. It's office at zoaphilly.org or info at zoa.org and on our websites, www.philly.zoa.org or zoa.org. There are places to donate. Please uh, do so. Coming up from ZOA on Zoom uh, tomorrow, 1 p.m., our next book club. My colleague Liz Burney is going to be interviewing author uh, Joel Gilbert. He's an author and a filmmaker, actually discussing the classic work, Lone Wolf by Shmuel Katz, about the life of uh, Jabotinsky. Tuesday, July 7th, um, the, another book club event with Alan Dershowitz, that's at 7 p.m. July 15th, we have an event, and also July 16th, we will be notifying you about these by email, so please check your email regularly, and uh, please again support ZOA and the vital work that we do. There's nobody doing the kind of work that ZOA is doing and we need your support, especially now. And we're actually going to try and uh, end on time. I want to thank my colleagues, Alan and Natalie, for helping out on the back end. I want to thank our panelists, Bruce and Jerry, for your valuable contributions today, and Bruce also for your sponsorship. And again, I want to recognize my colleagues, Stuart in Pittsburgh and Sharona in Florida, who are the executive directors of those respective chapters. If you live in those areas in Florida or Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, please be in touch with them. There's contact information on the National ZOA website. And I wanna thank you all very much for tuning in today. And I wish everybody continued health and have a good day. And please be active on behalf of Israel. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.